Our presenter today is Dr. Heather Weinrich. Dr. Weinrich is an assistant professor and director of research in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Her background includes completing a Master in Public Health Epidemiology at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She attended medical school at the University of Minnesota and graduated with her MD in 2008. She completed the trifecta of degrees from Minnesota by, by completing her residency in <laughs> otolaryngology. <laughs> <laughs> With a love of the ear and hearing, she went on to complete a fellowship in otology, neurotology, and skull-based surgery at Johns Hopkins University. In 2018, she moved to Illinois and has since been on faculty at UIC. She believes in positively influencing the medical education, training, and practice of female physicians by exploring sex differences and ergonomics and the impact this has on efficiency, confidence, and wellness of the surgeon. Dr. Weinrich is a surgeon scientist and is one of three scholars in UIC's NIH Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health Program. Friends, please welcome our presenter, Dr. Heather Weinrich. Oh, thank you so much. That's, um, that's very lovely. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm yeah, Dr. Heather Weinreich, and I'm, yeah, otolaryngology, you know it as ear, nose, and throat. I'll even further confuse you on what's called a neurotologist, which is an ear and skull-based surgeon. And the, the, the question you're probably asking yourself is why, <laughs> why is there an ENT surgeon talking to me about gender differences? And so I will explain that a little bit. But um, most of us know, we, we were just, Ramon and I were talking about this, we've been in this pandemic for two years, and we know that there has been enough that has come out about the differences for how women have been experiencing the pandemic. And the goal today is to talk about what is happening with our faculty here at UIC. I'm not going to go into anything else, you know, other, um, other institutions have published on, but to really talk about our own experience. So how did this come about and why are you having, oh, uh, let me start it up. Why are you having an ENT doctor <laughs> explain to you about gender differences? So um, as Ramona said, I am one of three BIRCH scholars and BIRCH stands for the Building of Interdisciplinary um, Career or Research Careers in Women's Health. And it is a program that's funded through the NIH. So basically the College of Medicine got a K-12 grant and they support three scholars and three associates. And at the time, in March of 2020, we were in this bridging position. Um, and so we had a bridging scholar as well. And every month, our group would meet. And right at the beginning of the pandemic, February, March, we had one of our monthly meetings. And we were all lamenting the impact of the, the, um, the shutdown was having on our careers. And so I used that term in the beginning, this thing called you know, work-life balance. And I hate that term because it's, it, just, it just doesn't happen. As all of us are here, I'm assuming our, you know, academics or professionals, and we have a professional career, and I'm going to call that your pie, and you have another, a home pie, or your, your pie that is outside of whatever your work career is. And there are times when our work pie becomes a little bit bigger, and there are times when our home pie becomes a little bit, you know, um, bigger. So that, there's not a balance, right? It's just what you need to focus your intention on. So we felt both, you know, all of us here that our pies were just getting bigger. Um, and then we were also talking about the slices within the pie, how the pandemic was starting to affect what I'm spending my time on. So I'm one of the scholars, Dr. Pavitra Kotini Shah, she's in the Department of Emergency Medicine. And then Dr. Bernice Mann is in the Department of Medicine. And so we felt that my our pies were changing. So for ENT, the clinical volume pie became much, much smaller. And we started to have administrative duties that we're taking on. At the same time, my research was taking a hit. Pavitra works in the emergency department and her clinical pie was exploding at the beginning of the pandemic and her research was taking a hit. Same thing for Dr. Mann. And so we wanted to know, well, what's happening with our other colleagues as they're going through this? And so led by one of our fearless co-PIs, Dr. Irina Buhimsky, um, she is a co-PI in the Birch, but she's also um, in the department of OBGYN we started talking about, we wanted to look at what is happening with our faculty, wanted to survey them. And given that we are not gender scholars um, and we don't know really how to do this, um, we were starting to look in the literature for how we could evaluate our faculty. And we came across a New York Times piece that featured Dr. Barbara Risman, who happened to be from the University of Illinois at Chicago in the Department of Sociology. So our group reached out to Dr. Risman 
who also put us into contact with Dr. Laura Hirschfield. And Dr. Hirschfield is a sociologist in the College of Medicine in the Department of Medical Education. And we collaborated with them to figure out how do we, how do we survey? First of all, how do we create a survey? And then how do we survey our faculty to find out what are these differences that are happening? And with any um, research group, you need a statistician. And so Dr. Ruth Povey joined us um, because she also works in the Department of Emergency Medicine and that formed our research group. And we've subsequently um, created a name because with every research group, right, you need a name. And so we call ourselves DART, the Data-Driven Academics Recovery Team, because we've continued to work together. So our hypothesis, and this is not going to be surprising to anybody here, we felt that all faculty members would have had a substantial change in that, that work-life balance. I know I said I wasn't going to use that, but that everything kind of increased compared to the pre-COVID time. But we also suspected that in our own population, right, women, and we're going to, and, and apologize, you guys know far more about gender, um, and that's why we worked with Dr. Rissman about this, but yeah, women, individuals that self-identified as a woman would have a greater change in those, those that balance, and then ultimately, they're, they had a greater decrease in work productivity. So the objectives were to describe the characteristics of the university faculty, specifically, we wanted to look at self-reported stress levels. And then we wanted to apply something called latent class analysis. And, and the reason for this, and I'll, I'll explain this statistical uh, method to you further, further in, the, in the presentation, but we also felt that it was a little bit more nuanced than simply just gender. Because at the time, I also had a male colleague who had young children at home who was struggling with, again, maintaining what was going on in the home as well as maintaining what he was doing at work. And so we wanted to identify more personal and professional characteristics that are shared by a group. And then also to look at those changes in productivity within those different individual, or those different groups. And then finally, we wanted to determine aspects of the pandemic that may have either helped or not help productivity. And, and again, we were coming at from the angle of clinicians. So we looked at the kind of the three pillars that we have in the College of Medicine, which is clinical research and teaching. Because also in our discussions, there was definitely things at the beginning of the pandemic that we really felt helped us. And there were things obviously that were more negative. So we had a study design of a cross-sectional survey of 93 questions. And this was given out via email listservs. And the, the questionnaires, were a conglomerate of uh, validated questionnaires that already had existed that Dr. Rismet had used to evaluate um, faculty productivity and some other aspects of, of, of the faculty and academic environment. And then we added our own questionnaire uh, questions regarding um, COVID. And then the population we targeted with the health sciences colleges, again, because we felt that the pandemic was so unique in how it was affecting individuals within the health, um, you know, and in terms of, especially with the College of Medicine. The survey was given out between September and November of 2020. And the perspective that the, the, um, the individual replying to the survey was to take was where they were at the beginning of the pandemic compared to pre-pandemic. And I'm going to refer to that further on as spring of 2020. That spring of 2020, how you're comparing it to where you were prior to the pandemic starting. So we looked at changes in perceived stress levels, the changes in productivity, again, in those, those three pillars, clinical research and teaching, your positive and negative impacts of, of pa uh, the pandemic on stress and productivity, and then our analysis, descriptive analysis, this latent class analysis, and then we did some content and text mine analysis of some open-ended responses, um, and we'll present that as well. And like everybody else at the beginning of the pandemic, we met on Zoom. Um, every, every Wednesday uh, for about a year, we met weekly, and now we meet every other week um, uh, regarding our research. And I will say that we've talked about this as a group. This was a touchstone of... Um, for me every week. Because again, as the pandemic, you don't know what's going on. Every week I could meet with this group. We had shared experiences. It was a chance to vent. It was you know, a chance to just bond over something, yet also have this kind of focus of what we were gonna do um, with our professional, professional time as things had shut down. So here's what we found. So on the left-hand side, we had about 500 respondents, 60% were women, 80% were white, 80% were married or cohabitating, 82% were full-time, 47% had a, a degree other than most of them were MDs that re replied, but they had PhDs, doctors in public, public health. And I brought this out because this was something that I, I wasn't shocked with, but it, it hit home with me that 70% of our respondents were caring for an aging and or ill parent or dependent in the home. 
And part of this is me coming in as a perspective as being a woman and being, I'm a mother that I always feel like when people talk about home life and the struggles, right? It's the housework and it's childcare, but it's not just childcare. And especially when we think of baby boomers and as they age or the baby boomers and their parents, we're dealing with aging parents in our home that when we think of caregiving, we needed to broaden the definition um, more than just children. On the right-hand side, here is our numbers. So average age was about 50. About a third of the respondents did not have children. The distribution regarding rank. And for us, we did compare this to what is in, um, you know, taken from the greater population of the, the health sciences. This was very representative of the, the ranks and the distribution of it. 32% were tenured. Um, and what's a little bit different compared to um, outside of the health science, specifically the, the College of Medicine, a lot of our clinicians are not on a tenure track. They're on a clinical track, but they don't need, they're not on tenure. And that might be a little bit unusual, especially for the College of Medicine compared to other colleges. And about 50%, almost 50% of our respondents were with the College of Medicine. And then we had um, individuals that self-identified as women and self-identified as a man. And then we looked at the comparisons between those two. And for us, the key differences were that the women were about almost 10 years younger than the male respondents. More women did not have children. And then of the ones that did have children, men were more likely to have more children at home. Not surprisingly, more women were assistant professors. More men were full professors more men were tenured. And then again, the distribution was roughly about the same, even though there might have been a little bit, and these were the other colleges, maybe more men were in other colleges compared to, to women. So then we wanted to look at stress levels, right? That was our first, our first hypothesis. Everybody's stress levels would increase. This is a violin plot. And for, for simplicity's sake, a, a violin plot is very similar to a histogram, but it doesn't add up to 100%. So you don't, if you don't add up all those numbers, it doesn't equal 100%. It's kind of like a percentage or a, um, uh, yeah, a density would be the better way to describe it. So on the left-hand side, you have a Likert scale. Neutral is right here, right in the middle. These are individuals, if you had more stress, you're going to be above the line. If you have less stress, you're going to be below the line. And again, the, the, the comparison is where you are now in that spring of 2020 period before, you know, compared to before the pandemic started. On the right hand side, we're going to have in blue our home life activities, on the left hand side of our work related activities. And when you just look at the slide, you can tell everybody's stress level is above that line. More people are increased than more people are going to be decreased. When we look at the individual components that go into each of those pies, we have departmental meetings, manage, managing a research group securing funding, scholarly productivity, which we defined as ability to plan and to get manuscripts out the door, teaching responsibilities, advising responsibilities, committees and administrative duties, and then clinical responsibilities. And you can clearly see all of them are above that line and pretty substantial in terms of securing funding is more stressful, scholarly productivity, teaching is more stressful, and clinical responsibilities. Not necessarily surprising. And then we kind of felt like, again, as everybody is shifting to moving to remote learning, they have to figure out what they're gonna do for their didactics and then combine with just what was happening in the clinical space. In our home life, household responsibilities, like the day-to-day -day tasks of, of keeping a house running, childcare and caring for someone in the home, personal health and financial obligations. Again, everything is going above that line, but clearly childcare and caring for someone that's disabled, a lot more people are reporting that was stressful. Then we wanted to look at those between gender differences. So between men and women, there were no difference. I remember everybody's stress level is higher, but again, the, the type and the, the level of stress is not different for departmental meetings, managing a research group, securing funding, managing a household financial obligations. But what was difference between men and women in work-related activities and home life? Again, scholarly productivity, teaching responsibilities, advising, and clinical responsibilities were far more stressful for our women respondents than our male respondents. And for home life, again, everybody's above this line, but women reported much more stress with childcare, caring for someone in the home, and their own personal health. So, that was just the, the, the women and the men. And like we said, we wanted to look at this a little bit more in depth. So now we get to this latent class analysis. So the word class doesn't have a connotation to it. It doesn't mean a hierarchy. It doesn't mean a value. It's just some people will use class. Some people will use cluster. And we're going to use class for the purpose of this because that's what the model is called. So 
the idea with latent class or LCA is that instead of you taking your data and you put in variables to piece out how you're going to look at relationships, you let the data tell you the story. And so the example here is that I, if we have a heterogeneous population, right, like we did, we, we take our population, our survey, and we have a bunch of different individuals within that. Those individuals have very different characteristics, but you can already see when you look at that one class, there are some similarities, right? There seem like some of the shapes are blue, some are red, some are rounded, some have little missing pieces in it. And what you can do is you start adding those components into a model. And if we do that, we can start dividing our population into classes. So here we would have a two class model and class one is more likely, you know, they have more often blue. They're more often to have at least one rounded perimeter. They're less likely to be elongated versus class two, right? They're more likely to be red, more often at least one sharp angle and more often to be elongated. But you can see it is not an all or none, right? People can have, or individuals or in this shape shapes, they can have types of characteristics, but they don't have to have all the characteristics. So it's kind of based on a probability. So that if you were to take a shape out of pro, you know, class one, the likelihood is you would pick out one that is blue and round and less elongated. All right. How many variables that you add into the model? It varies. So there is statistical methods for figuring out what's going to improve the fit of the model. So there's some thought, right? You could add in two clusters is better than one cluster. Three is better than two. Basically, you add in the model. But the idea here is, especially down here, if we had a model where we had 13 classes, it's really not helpful if you wanted to do an intervention. I think about like a classroom. And if we keep dividing groups into smaller and smaller groups, I can't create a pattern and I can't apply a policy to that group. So that makes sense. That's all you need to know about LCA. So we found a four class solution or four clusters in this population. On the left hand side is probability. So that is the probability that that class would have that characteristic with it. If they're above the line, they're more likely to have it. If they're below the line, they're less likely and 50% is kind of a toss up. On the X axis are the different variables that added into the model that we felt like improved it or provided some sort of differentiation between the different groups, okay? So the first was class one. Individuals in this group were more likely to have work stress, high work stress, home stress, more likely to identify as a woman, more likely to be an assistant professor, they were less likely to be tenured, and about more, you know, 50-50 likelihood they would have a child less than 12 years of age in the home. Class two, same thing as high work stress, high home stress, again, more likely to identify as being female, more likely to be an associate professor, more likely to be tenured, and again, 50-50 likelihood they would have a child less than 12 years of age in the home. Contrast with class three, likely to have a little bit of work stress, less likely to have home stress, more likely to identify as a man, and more likely to be a professor, more likely to be tenured, and very less likely to have a child young in the home. And finally, class four, low work stress, low home stress, more likely to be a, to identify as a man, not really likely to be any one of these ranks, but maybe more likely or increased likely to be in a visiting or adjunct professor, not likely to be tenured, not likely to have a children at home, okay? So that can kind of help, you know, decide out. I have to move move everybody over to my left hand side so I can see my slide. So what we found was, okay, that's very interesting. We also found it was kind of hard to keep class or these patterns in our mind. And so bear with me, but we all came up with an idea of using an animal. Because when I do the next couple of slides, keep this in mind. So we felt like our class one are our worker bees. These are young faculty, more likely to be women, maybe have children at home, but they're younger in their career, they're working hard, they want to, you know, basically want to teach, they want to do all of these things to start working on towards their promotion. Class two are your workhorses. These are mostly associate professors who have already established themselves, they've already got tenure. A lot of times departments are going to depend on them for fulfilling responsibilities, provide advising, teaching, and they also are working on their promotion to get to that professor. So they're going to be producing papers and grants. Our class threes are our owls, our wise leaders is the way that we put it, especially when we think about the College of Medicine, a lot of our leaders are, are men, all right? And then class four, we struggled with, and we were trying to think of an animal that's kind of laid back because what we felt were these faculty, there's not a lot of stress at home. They don't have a lot, you know, they're not gonna have young children. They're not having a lot of home or work stress. They're working hard. And especially when I think about the College of Medicine, a lot of our adjunct and visiting uh, faculty members are clinicians. They come in, they do the work and then they leave. They don't have to write papers. They don't have to do all these other things. 
So now let's look at the distribution for the pi. Remember we talked about the pi, right? So we're gonna look at the work pi. When we talk about work, where, where were people spending their time? So here, and we define change in productivity. I, I guess, you know, we had some nuances, I think with that word, but idea here is think again, where are you spending your time? Productivity doesn't necessarily mean putting out papers, but how are you spending your time either in administrative roles, in teaching roles, clinical roles, or are you actually having time to do research? Here, we've got departmental meetings and functions, committee responsibilities, and clinical responsibilities. On the y-axis is your percent. So this is the, the percentage of people that said either it was increased, decreased, or no change in terms of the time they were spending in these areas. And on the x-axis are going to have our classes, and you're just going to remember those, those little animals, okay? Red is increased time. Dark green is decreased time. Light green is going to be no change in time. When we look at departmental meetings, you can see right away, and these were statistically significant. For the sake of our, our lecture here, I wasn't going to give you lots of numbers, but or like nuances of statistics. But knowing that when you look at this, class two, they had an increase in their department. More people were reporting that they were spending more time in departmental meetings and also in class one. Really no change in class three. And again, class four is a little bit different, right? Because they don't have all these other responsibilities. So we would expect there would not be much of a change in those categories. But look at class three, not much of a change, some increase, but not as much as our class ones and twos. For committee responsibilities, class two had a significant increase compared to the other classes in terms of the time that they're spending the committee administrative responsibilities, followed by class one. And again, not much of a change we could see in class three and four. And then for clinical responsibilities here, more respondents in class one we're talking about, they had increased time doing clinical responsibilities versus you know, the other three classes, but also an increase in class two. So the pie is changing for those classes, not as much as for our class threes and fours. And then when we look at the productivity in terms of what I'm producing for my research, here, things that are decreased are bad. You can see right off our bat, our class twos, those work courses had a greater percentage reporting that they're decreasing the amount of grants they're writing. And look at this for their scholarly productivity. They are taking more time doing all of this other stuff and less time writing. And that's critical, especially when we think about our faculty that are on tenure tracks, right? That they need to be able to produce so that they can become professors. Then we looked at those perspectives of what, were, what was good and bad about the pandemic. And here, remember your classes on the left-hand side, here are the negative impacts, here are the positive impacts. And here we just text mined and put it into word clouds. And on the left-hand side, the things that are negative, I want you to look at class one and class two. And obviously what stands out to everybody is this thing, remote learning. And if you were a parent with a young child at the time, you know how stressful that was um, at the beginning of the pandemic. The other thing is just social distancing, right? And I, we thought this was so interesting that the mental health was a negative impact or the, the impact of the pandemic affecting mental health in our class to our associate professors and those women. For class three and four, what stands out is reduced social contact, social activities, loss of interactions with friends and family, cabin fever, being stuck at home, and the same thing kind of with class four. But across the board, uh, the positive impacts, all four classes, it was time at home, time with family, and time not commuting. And that was one of the things all of us talked about. I live up in the northern suburbs, and for me not to sit in a car for two hours to be able to spend time with my kid was far more beneficial. And one of the things that was great that came out of the pandemic. So then we asked, what were things individually within those member of those silos that increased or decreased you know, the, from the pandemic? And what faculty responded was, from the clinical side, access to telehealth increased our productivity, having more hours, because we had to shut down. That was one of the things that decreased productivity at the beginning of the pandemic. We had to limit schedules. We had to stop seeing patients. We had to stop operating. But telehealth was a growing pain. It was hard at the beginning in terms of we didn't have cameras, there was no platforms, you didn't know where patients were getting on and off, it was very difficult. On the research side, things that helped people ma maintain their productivity in research was not commuting. Again, just like me, spending time in front of a computer writing was beneficial. 20% felt more focused at home. I want you to contrast that with almost 20% said it was not better to be at home. They had children that were interrupting, it was very stressful. The other thing I loved about this was that our faculty felt that they had time to think. 
time to actually research, come up with new ideas instead of getting inundated with some of this other stuff. But they had a loss of that collaboration, those impromptu mood meetings, you know, where you would have somebody in the hallway and you're just thinking of an idea. And then clearly with everybody stopping, not being able to go into the lab, that was a, there was a huge stressor and a huge drop in productivity. On the teaching side, what were things that faculty liked? They liked not commuting. They liked that some of the faculty or the, the students, when you went to a Zoom platform, some of their shy students were able to use the chat function. There was more of an interaction and they loved the flexibility that they had in scheduling and balance. But it was clear that there was a loss of connection with students. And we all know that, right? We've been on Zoom for two years. It is hard not to have that connection with your audience. So what came out of this work? Well, one is the biggest punchline we took away from that class analysis was that our leaders we're experiencing the pandemic very different from the rest of us. If you don't see the problem, you don't think it exists. And why would you ever think about creating a solution for it? So we needed to meet with a college of medicine dean and department heads to say, this is the difference from what you guys are experiencing from what I'm experiencing. Dr. Risman heads the UIC faculty equity committee and we presented this work there. And then we also had a national presentation. We presented the work at our annual Birch meeting and we got a publication out of it. The, the theme of the publication was, this is what was happening at, at our institution, but for us to figure out what to do while we're in this pandemic, we, you need to know at your own institution what's happening because they're gonna be different. And so we've had organizations reach out to us to use their survey to, ass to use our survey to assess their population. And then there were a number of recommendations and initiatives. The first was Dr. Pauline Mackey, who is also the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs in the College of Medicine, has helped put together this program called HEP program. And the idea here is that it would allow for creating these cross-mentoring pods where senior faculty members would lead pods in mentorship that would be comprised of junior and mid-faculty members and primarily targeting our minority faculty members. Because again, all of this happened with our research and all of these things that happened that started to limit our ability to move forward in our promotion, this was a focus. They're in the process right now of recruiting members for that. The other thing she did was took the childcare and the caregiving information to the university. And, and again, the university system right now just has an RFP sitting out for this for caregiving services. Um, I will say I'm, I'm pleased that it's even on the radar now. Um, things have been obviously hindered because of the pandemic and other processes, but at least they are recognizing that child care is a problem for their faculty. And finally, Dr. Risman was able to, um, through her, her committee, provide two recommendations to the provost. The first was to allow for expansion of the survey to the full faculty, and I'll give us a quick overview of the preliminary data that we have on that. And then also some recommendations to how to mitigate the effect of the pandemic on faculty careers. And this included things like setting aside you know, funds for course releases or research projects for untenured faculty that are on the tenure faculty because things got, you know, basically were, were held for a period of time. Um, creation of university policies that allowed for flexibility and how, you know, spending or a time frame for when research and startup funds could be used. And then also to, for the, the provost to start looking at um, the financial implications of a tenure rollback. Most of us know that there was a six month voluntary tenure rollback. But again, for me to take a tenure rollback is great. I have time to go further on my tenure track. But I, you know, if I'm going to be promoted six months later than I knew she would, there's, there's a financial hit that happens with that. So that was 2020. <laughs> and we're still in the pandemic. So we wanted to know what has changed. And so this is where, again, the survey gets sent out about a year later. And what we had talked about as a group is we felt that all faculty members, you know, we're in this for a year, right? Our stress levels have got to be a little bit better. And we also felt like faculty members, because we're all resilient, right, as humans, we can adapt. We felt like we would increase in our productivity. Things would start to normalize, right, because we're in the new normal. So the same thing, faculty um, survey gets sent, sent out to the entire university. We're looking at the same sort of things in terms of stress levels, productivity, self-care. And the way that I'm going to present the data is two ways. One is I'm going to look at the respondents in spring of 2020 compared to the respondents in spring of 2021. We'll call that the evolution of the pandemic. And then the new now, right? The new normal where we're just gonna look at those gender difference like we did before in spring of 2021, right? The, the women that responded compared to the men that responded in spring of 2021. So of all of respondents in 2021, we had all, you know, 575 respondents, very similar characteristics to the ones that responded in spring of 2020, okay? Here are the big punchlines. And again, this is preliminary. We're still going through all of this data. 
The punchline here is that we're still stressed. 60% of faculty report increased stress for their home life. They report increased stress due to health and caring for other um, family members. Tenure track, but not on the tenure, you know, tenure, not tenured, I should say, faculty face more related stress. Because again, you, you have a clock and you're supposed to keep moving towards that clock. You took a rollback, but you're still moving on the clock. Scholarly productivity is still decreased compared to the pre-pandemic time, right? We have not gone back to those that, you know, previous, you know, 2020, 2019 timeframe. Teaching responsibilities are still increased and 75% of the faculty reported that teaching is still stressful. It's more stressful than it was in the pre-pandemic time. And then 64% reported that it is, it is stressful to maintain scholarly productivity. It's becoming hard. For race, Asian faculty reported more work-related stress than their white respondents in both clinical responsibilities and securing funding. Our black faculty reported more stress related to clinical responsibilities and teaching responses you know, compared to all other faculty. And our Asian and black faculty here, 50% and 53 respectively, report a significantly greater increase in advising responsibilities than their white faculty. So think about, again, what Dr. Mackey's trying to do with these, these pods is to help support our faculty because they're, they are facing more stress and more advising response and all these other factors that, are, that could affect their promotion. For women, increased stress around their scholarly productivity, increased commitment and administrative responsibilities, greater increase in advising responsibilities, and faculty with children less than 12 years of age in home felt that the departments were less gender friendly than other departments. This is just a quick breakdown. We have not done comparisons between these and why I divided up. So majority of our respondents, again, College of Medicine, a big bulk of our respondents came from the liberal arts and then everybody else we kind of combined together in other colleges, just because when you start going through demographics, you actually could probably potentially start identifying faculty. Here's the, the, the I kind of bolded the big differences between the groups. And again, we have not done statistics between these groups. College of Medicine, faculty tend to be older. The women tend to be younger in those respondents. Um, they are, there are more children for, I should say more faculty that have children in the College of Medicine. There are more that are gonna be, you know, full professors on that side. In the liberal arts, more are married, more are tenured and more are full-time. And then kind of that's all compared with the, the college of uh, the other colleges. So quickly, if I've got time, we'll go through a little bit of the latent class analysis that we did with our groups. And again, you kind of know how we did this. Here's the quick rundown for each of those colleges and the classes that that data kind of tells us about. The first is the College of Medicine. And when we did this, we had two classes this time around in those respondents. Remember, the data tells you it. You don't apply the class to the data. The data tells you it. And this time around, we had two classes. These individuals in class one, the dark line, are more likely women more likely assistant professors and tenured, and more likely to have a child age 12 years or younger in the household versus class two, which were more likely men, professors and tenured and less likely to have a child age 12 years or younger. So in this case, gender still plays a role and rank still plays a role. And when we looked at the stress responses within classes, it is not surprising when you think about that. More work stress reported for departmental meetings, clinical responsibilities, are for our class one versus our class two. So again, there's still these differences. Our leaders are not as stressed still as our, our younger faculty. And they were less productive, almost one manuscript less um, during, and again, this is a year into the pandemic. More home stress, not surprisingly, again, when we think about those characteristics, managing a household and financial obligations, but there was no difference in self-care in terms of the percentage that we're responding that. For liberal arts, two classes were identified. And here, look at this, class one, equal likelihood they were either men or women, more likely to be associate professors or professors, tenured, and less likely to have a child, a young child at home. Contrast that with class two. Again, equal likelihood they could you know, self-identified as a man or a woman, assistant professors more likely, not on a tenure track, and less likely to have children at home. And so for our liberal arts college, gender is not much of an issue. Rank is a bigger issue and children are not as much of an issue. And when we look at their stress levels now, class one reports more committee responsibilities, no differences in home stress and mental health care services. And I always think back to, again, that first time we did the study and think about those word clouds, again, mental health was an, an issue with that group that was primarily our associate professors. And there are workhorses. 
And finally, we'll do quickly the LCA for the other colleges. And the issue with the other colleges is again, I'm not surprised we have four classes here because it's, it's a bunch of different colleges. It's a more heterogeneous population. But here for class one, again, more likely to be women, assistant professors, not on a tenure track and less likely to have children. I think of those are early career faculty members, young women, no children at home. Class two are more likely to be women, professors not on a tenure track and less likely to have children at home. Class three are still more likely to be women, assistant professors not on the tenure track, but here's what changes. They're more likely to have children at home. And class four are more likely to be men, associate professors, tenured and with children at home. So there's a little bit of nuances that are go along with this. And here's how that breaks down. So class two and four, are more like that, you know, more stressed with scholarly productivity. I think of that a little bit as our class one or maybe starting, right? And they're not as worried about getting as moving on to those different levels. They're less likely to have stress, right? Class two are, you know, have more committee responsibilities than our one, two, threes, and fours. Home stress, not surprising, those that have a child at home, managing, you know, a household is a little bit more stressful than ones and twos. And then childcare, threes and fours are gonna have more stress than ones and twos. And then mental health services increased for threes and fours over the ones and twos. So the last thing, do I have time? We'll quickly go through this. Then what we did is we further drilled down and this is all, again, we're gonna start doing more comparisons between the colleges. And then we further drilled down into the College of Medicine. Because again, College of Medicine, we had such a big respondents group in 2020. We kind of wanted to do the same thing. We wanted to look at, okay, what are the differences in the, the spring of 2020 respondents to the spring of 2021, and then look at within the genders, and then the comparisons in spring of 2021 to men and women. Here we have 350 respondents total. So this includes spring of 20 and spring of 2021. A little bit more women responded in, the, in spring of 2020 than spring of 2021. We did comparisons within the genders, you know, meaning looking at the women that responded in 2020 to 2021, not no differences in, in the, the characteristics and the demographics. For men, the only thing is that the men that responded in spring of 2021 were slightly older, okay, about 10 years older, okay, which also means they're a little bit older than the women, right? Because remember that difference with it. Um, and we see that here, okay? So the last couple slides we're gonna go through, we'll go through these quickly, because again, I don't want P values, I don't want that. There's their are error bars, we're doing all of that. I want you to look at the patterns of things and stress levels. And before you don't jump to the, I know a lot of people wanna to jump to the, the women and the men. I want you to stay within gender first, okay? And we'll go back then to look at the, the difference between the men and the women. Cumulative work stress. Across the board, you can see within genders, right? Everybody's stress level for work has decreased, but men have decreased substantially. So women, we kind of said, eh, it's gotten a little bit better. You know, the respondents say that the number of respondents have said that, you know, less likely to have stress. For men, more respondents said that they were not as stressed in 2021. For home stress, more women reported a decreased stress level, okay? So that it seems like women's stress level at home is improving. For men, there wasn't much of a difference. When we look at home stress or work stress, look at this, let's go through within gender, we'll start with women. So for departmental meetings, managing a research group, securing funding, scholarly productivity, teaching, advising, committee, clinical responsibilities, all those different components. For women, less women reported stressful for departmental meetings, not much of a change in the percentage of respondents for managing a research group. There are more women now saying that it's stressful to get securing for funding, slightly more women reporting the stressful for scholarly productivity, a slight decrease in teaching responsibilities, slight decrease in advising, no real difference in our committee responsibilities and a slight drop in our clinical responsibilities. Contrast that with our men. The men are reporting decrease, so less men are reporting increased stress with the department meetings. They're a little bit more stress, right? Reporting with managing a research group, no change in securing funding, slightly increase in scholarly productivity, no significant, or little slight drip, I should say, drop in teaching, no changes in advising, drop in committee responsibilities, and drop in our clinical responsibilities. For our home life, start with the women. No real change in household responsibilities, a slight bump in child care responsibilities, slight decrease in caring for someone that is ill, slight or very minimal change in personal health, and slight decrease in financial obligations. For our men, 
increasing household responsibilities are more stressful. More men are reporting that childcare is stressful. More men are reporting caring for someone that is ill or disabled. No real change in their health. And then a decreased percentage reporting that financial obligations were stressful. So here's your take on points. For women, we think that work stress is still the same. It is still increased from the pandemic. All areas are grossly, for the most part, either the same or increased. And we either think it's catch up, meaning we put things on hold and now we're trying to keep up. We've either gotten more duties and we have not been able to get rid of those duties or actually things have actually increased for these individuals. Home stress is decreased, but our opinion, it just went back to where it was before. It's not like things got taken off our plates as women. For men, work's decreased for the most part, but home stress is still high for them. And it increased from the pandemic, but childcare and aging are a problem. And now you wanna go back and look at that spring of 2021, right? But before I do that, I wanna let you know everybody's productivity in terms of manuscripts increased. There's no differences in genders. So women are working in all these different areas. They are producing at the same amount as our men, but they're far more stressed doing it. For this difference between men and women in the spring of 2021, we have, and you saw that, I know you were all looking at that, right? You were looking at this, this difference between here and here now, right? Here are your punchlines for that. Women have increased work stress compared to men for all of these. But now when we look at home stress, there's no difference. And that's the key point that I want you to take away with is that child care is still an issue. And we looked at the age of the child. Remember all the stuff I presented that the age of the child less than 12? For here, it's not as important. If you have a child at home, it is stressful. And it doesn't matter if you're, you identify as a woman or a man. The last thing I'm gonna point out is, is self-care. So as I flip through the slides, and I'm sorry that it's blurry here, but the key thing you can see is, right, it looks kind of like these two are similar, right? In terms of maybe, you know, little less, you know, number of men, you know, smaller number of men are reporting stress with their personal health. But when we look at individual differences for the group that responded in 2021 between men and women, more women report disturbed sleep, disturbed diet, decreased exercise. And remember, their productivity is the same. So something's giving. They're working really hard. Home stress is a little bit better. Maybe men are picking up a little bit more of it. But women are compromising something, we think, to maintain that productivity. And you're asking yourself, too, the caveat is, my member, my respondents were older. But again, go back to that idea of the bee and the horse and the owls. Even though men may have some sort of different perspective, they may be older in these respondents, there are leaders and they need to understand what their younger assistant, associate, women faculty are going through. So here is my quick conclusions. The pandemic affected all faculty very differently, right? Our assistant associates, right, are dealing with higher work and home stress. They're dealing with children and childcare. They have more of these administrative duties and their research took a hit in this group, which affects them moving on to the next level. But our professors and our adjuncts, their productivity grossly was stable at the beginning of the pandemic and social isolation was an issue with them. The COVID pandemic has affected all the colleges, but it is very different. And what I can say at this point is the College of Medicine stress has improved for everyone and productivity has increased. However, our women faculty are still very stressed at work. Child care is a stressor for all faculty and women's self-care is not improved. And what I worry about as a female faculty member is burnout. There have been times when it's been so overwhelming over the past two years dealing with this that we want to leave. So that's something that our administrators need to know about. So we need new policies that need to be tailored to faculty. We need to take into account rank and roles in the colleges. We need to take into account caretaking responsibilities. We also need to recognize that the, the, the pandemics affected our work conditions. And we think that productivity needs to be defined for every function. When I'm productive at, at, in, in research, does that mean how many grants I put out? And then we should also tailor, where am I gonna be the most productive? Am I better at being in a car commuting for two hours or am I better being at home in my home office if I don't have somebody bothering me? These are the things that we recommended to the College of Medicine in terms of clinical productivity, research productivity, and teaching, allowing some sort of flexibility for our faculty. But we also wanted to know that this, the, the good side to the pandemic was we had more time at home and we have to allow for flexibility for our faculty to have that. Our future is to do that final analysis on the campus-wide survey. And we also want to drill down into culture and some other ways that we can provide a perception of support for our faculty. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that was kind of a, a motor mouth going through there. But we've got 10 minutes, I think, for questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Weinrich. Um, 
it was a lot to get through. <laughs> and I'm grateful that you, that you were willing to share all of that and that you made it through. Um, for folks who may not know, this is actually what we had in our agenda for the timing. I'm actually very impressed. <laughs> that you, you stopped right at, uh, at 12.50. So um, thank you so much. I mean, there's a lot to absorb yeah. and digest there. Um, and we, we do have a bunch of questions from folks. And um, you know, I've, I've recorded the questions that folks shared in the chat. I also wanna give the opportunity if anybody would like to ask a question out loud, if you can use the raise hand function, that would be really useful for me. Um, but if you can raise your hand, then I can go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. But um, I'm happy to start also with the questions that we received in the chat. Yeah. Um, so we had a question about um, if you could talk a little bit about some of the limitations um, of your oh. study. And so, yeah, so, you know, um, could you talk about, you know, even like the demographics of the people um, that you were able to survey, um, you know, any can you talk about non-binary or gender non-conforming individuals more people of color yeah. study. our numbers were low for our minor minority demographics and and uh, in our publication we ended up rolling everybody into cells more than five because we were very worried people would be able to be identified in the survey um and there was some concern and and again you know Dr. Rissman is coming at this from, you know, her position on the committee, as well as the gender studies. We were also worried that because of our, we didn't get like departmental data, we did colleges, but we were still worried that we did not have faculty respond because of that concern of being identified. Our numbers were low. And we hope that at least broadening it to the bigger university, it would be a little bit better. The issue with um, gender and sex was a great discussion. And it's interesting is that we, we did ask for sex and we asked for gender and we did. And then um, we had great feedback by the faculty community and that's you know how to ask about gender. Um, and we did not have in that initial survey, a number of individuals that did not um, uh, identify either as a woman or a man. And so again, they kind of get subsumed a little bit into the data or we pulled their data out. And I know that sounds awful, but again, we were trying to make sure we could not have people be identified, which was a concern. It was a big discussion. I'll be very candid. And again, I don't come from it as, as a, I mean, realistically, right? This, this audience knows more about this than we did. And we had to really rely on Dr. Hirschfeld and Dr. Risman of how to ask, ask that and how to, to um, include that data in there as well. So again, I did quickly the, the, the women and the men, I know that we're gonna have more data and the Office of um, uh, Institutional Research is working through that data right now. I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer for that. Definitely a limitation. The other thing is a limitation on, you know, such a bulk of our population was the College of Medicine. And a College of Medicine is such a unique experience. Um, you know, our, our the, the, the nursing, pharmacy, all of us, I think as clinicians, we're going through such a different time. We asked questions about, if you have a spouse that was um, a frontline worker, um, you know, we kind of asked all those other questions in there, but that's, yeah. I hope that answered it. Thank you. Um, so we had a bunch of questions around um, when you were sharing data about productivity. So I'm gonna yeah. see if I can uh, cluster some of these. Um, what accounts for the changes in productivity for the different classes? Like why did the pandemic increase meeting times, for example? And is that very unique and specific to um, the medical, right? The people in the medical yeah. field, it just, was it just more medical activity related to the pandemic? Um, other folks asked about, um, can you break down what's included in the committee and administrative positions? Are things like mentoring and advising students included in there? Um, wondering how much women faculty were being asked to do additional mental and emotional labor as student need went up. Very good point. Um, let's see if I'm, so well, you can start there. That's a lot right there. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And you know, this is one of the reasons why we wanted to expand it, right? To, to um, include the university because, I mean, Dr. Rissman is on the East campus. And, and again, as we would meet, hearing what she was going through in terms of you know, transitioning classes and, and what we were facing, absolutely, there's a big difference, I think, in number of meetings. I mean, from my own 
opinion, I, we increased a number of meetings, um, especially first of all, remote, right? Because Zoom now, before you would have to travel to get there. So meetings, I think we talked about either the, the actual number of meetings increased. And I think that did happen in the College of Medicine because we started instituting in our department, um, like daily, not daily huddles, but I think it was twice a week at the beginning, we would have a daily huddle to keep us updated on what was happening in the clinical volume, what was going to happen with our, because again, all our clinics shut down. And then we may or may not have been rerouted to different places. Um, you know, even like our residents, you know, they were supposed to be on an ENT rotation, but one of them was working, let's say in the ICU. So there was that. We also think that you were able to get to meetings now because they were Zoom. So I think that's that there's a little bit of that relative that maybe the total number didn't increase, but your ability to attend them now was increased. And there was an expectation, right? Because you're on Zoom and you're just sitting at home. Um, regarding the committee and administrative. So we did ask it, it as separate, right? So mentoring and advising was kind of in one bucket, teaching was in another bucket. And then these committee administrative positions were in another bucket. We did leave that a little bit to interpretation um, right, because again, part of this is all pragmatic in the sense of it is where you as a clinician or a faculty member think you're spending your time. If you, th even though maybe we didn't were nuanced that, that the mentoring that you did with this student was maybe teaching, it's what you think of your, your pie where you are spending your time, I guess is the way to put it. Um, I think that that is so true. I don't have any data on that. <laughs> but Kelly, I think that you're right. I think there has been we did a lot of emotional labor. I think there is emotional and mental labor. And even if it's not real, it is still our perception as faculty and does that perception, it probably does affect my self-care and it affects where I think I'm spending my time. I think you're right, we don't have the data on that. That is why, I mean, that next step is to drill down. Let's get into that, like why, what were you doing? Where do you think when you're in the pandemic, are you the one that's in the department making everybody feel okay? And that's putting added stress onto you. And that's what, yeah, we, we were thought, it thought about doing more qualitative um, process at this point, doing like focus groups. Thanks, Dr. Weinrich. I'm gonna think, I think I'm gonna share um, two questions in one. That'll probably be our last question that we have time for. Um, so we had questions about, um, in terms of, of your, your questions and your um, data collection, did the study ask about faculty's partners and their involvement in the home and caring aspects yeah. and was data collected on single versus married? So I know that you, you, I mean, you shared a data point about the number or the percentage of participants who were married around 80%, right? 80, 80, right. 80%. But did you collect data that differentiated between the experiences of people who are single versus married? Um, do you have any data you can share about that? We did collect that data. Um, and we do have it. We didn't go through it as much because it wasn't significant other than having a, a, a you know, I, if you notice when we did the latent class analysis, we did not include marriage um, or cohabitating or a partner or being single. It didn't add it to the model. It is, it is not as big of a factor as you think it is having the child doesn't matter if you're single, doesn't matter if you're a partner, it is stressful in that time period having a kid. Um, and again, your rank mattered more. That's why we wanted to look at it more than just, we are part of our environments. We are, we, our identity is more than just my gender, my rank, if I'm a child, if I'm married, right? We're, we're a gestalt of what we are. And to look at that, I don't have those numbers, but I know we, we did add it into the model and it didn't make a difference. Um, it may in the, again, that further, that bigger group, it may make a difference because you do see the difference in the percentage that are married between the different colleges. And again, you know, a third of our faculty that reported don't have children, but that doesn't mean they're not stressed, right? They have other stresses that they have to deal with. And that's what we want administration is, um, I mean, even take somebody that doesn't have a kid at the home, they might have an aging parent, right? I mean, we are stressed at home. And what I don't have data about, which I was floored by this, because I think this group, if you have this data, let me know. But I, you know, Dr. Herschel and I talked about it. In my, and again, my N of one is a woman. I feel like when my home life goes crazy, right? Because it's a pie, right? When the home life becomes crazy as a woman, I have to focus on the pie and my work will go to the side. I don't have the data to say if somebody identifies as a man, and I'm going to go very much thinking of my grandfather in the 1960s, when the home life got crazy, he had someone else to take care of that, and he could still be productive. 
And I worry that our leaders are still like that. Well, you know, why can't you figure it out? Some of, some of your faculty don't have partners. Some faculty have partners that are just as equally stressed. And that's what I think our new data is talking about is it doesn't matter if you're identified as a, a man or a woman, childcare, if you have somebody that you have to take care of, it is stressful and it will affect your productivity at work. So if you want me to go to be a good employee and be an awesome workforce and go on to be a, you know, promoted, I need help at home. I do. I want to be here <laughs> to work, but I need help. Oh, these are great questions about the children. We didn't look at the vaccine yet. We were before the vaccine. We did look at the 12 versus, we, that's how we made the decision between kids that are in high school and college age kids. And then the ones that were younger than 12, that's how we, we made that decision. We did not look at remote learning for those age groups, but that's how we tried to, to look at that. That's a great question. So we are out of time. Oh my gosh. So, so I know. It flew by, it flew by, it flew by, but that's, you know, that's okay, right? Because this creates an opportunity for continuing conversations. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm sure you've been having very many. Um, so I do want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Of course, I want to thank, thank Dr. Weinrich. Um, thank you to our partner in bringing this series together, the Gender and Women's Studies Program. We invite you to join us for our next Feminisms Lunch Lecture, which will be held on Tuesday, April 5th. We'll be hosting a presentation by UIC PhD student Nirupama Jayaraman on the relationship between gender and mobility, focusing on public transportation systems in Madurai, India. You can find information about that and all of our many upcoming events on our website, which is wlrc.uic.edu. It is Women's History Month. We have a lot of cool stuff coming up. Uh, stuff that is geared towards specifically toward faculty. We have stuff that's geared specifically towards students. We have events that are open to everybody. So we really want to invite you to come and join us. They will all be virtual. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Weinrich. Thank you all of you for thank joining you. us today. We hope to see you all again soon. We hope you have a great afternoon. Kelly, thank you for sharing. Uh, the link to our website in the chat and you're getting a lot of uh, thank, thank you, you gratitude for accolades in the chat and feedback. I mean, like I said, this group, we really um, we want to support faculty. And if you have thoughts or questions, please, you know, e feel free to email me. Like I said, we our group meets every other week. I'll give feedback. And again, we're still the office, like I said, of institutional research is still working on the data. And so we're trying to advocate, but please feedback whatever we can do to help support each other. That's what, that's what we want. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care.